Hi, everybody. I uh, hope you're enjoying uh, the conference as much as I am, and enjoying some nice lunch now. Um, it's my pleasure to make a few remarks and maybe hope to and maybe stimulate some discussion and 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 uh, have some dialogue here about about big tech. Uh, I don't have a I don't have a book to sell, unlike the previous meal speaker. Um, I, I, I am I do have a book in the works that I hope will be available about this time next year, which is a highly politically incorrect defense of private hierarchies. So I look forward to pimping that book um, at next year's Supporters Summit uh, in, in Vienna. Uh, you know, I think most, most freedom-loving people have a love-hate relationship with technology, right? This, is, this is, is true as far back as the days of the printing press, you know, and every other major uh, technological innovation, whether it's improvements in transportation, in communication, in um, you know, calculating machines, computers, and so forth. You know, like any other tool, technology can be used for good or for ill, and we certainly see a lot of that. Uh, that certainly comes out in a lot of our thinking and, and concerns and so forth about, about technology today. So I just want to offer a few, a few claims or propositions about big tech that I hope will be useful in, in formulating, you know, helping us sort of think through the relevant issues, figure out what we might want to do or not do uh, to make things better, okay? So, point number one, big tech firms do a lot of bad things. Okay, it's okay to have bad feelings about technology platforms, technology products, even though they are private, you know, in, in the most case, you know, they're private entities operating on the market. Um, you know, I sometimes hear people say, well, well, you know, how can you criticize something that, you know, Google is doing or something that Facebook is doing? Aren't you in favor of big companies? Aren't you pro-capitalist? What, do you hate the market? Uh, to, 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 to borrow an example from the great Tom Woods, you know, if I go to a nice restaurant and I order a steak and it isn't prepared the way I want and I send it back, it doesn't mean I hate capitalism, right? It doesn't make me a socialist. It means I'm engaged in voluntary interaction and voluntary transactions, and I don't like the, you know, what, what this, the seller did not deliver to me what I expected. Maybe I even go and leave a bad review on Yelp or something. That doesn't make me anti-market. Likewise, being in favor of the market, right? We, we sometimes say, you know, we're in favor of competition, not specific competitors. Right? Doesn't mean I love every company that has become profitable and every company that's large and successful in the free market. Um, I can choose to patronize those I like and don't like, and I can, I can choose to encourage my friends and family to patronize those I like or don't like. The great thing about capitalism and, and the market, as opposed to the political sphere, right, is that we don't all have to consume the same product. Right? We don't, we don't vote on which company will be the provider of X and whichever company gets 51% of the vote, then we all consume that product. No, we can each consume whatever product we want, and if you and I have different preferences over what we like, that's fine. All, you know, both of us can be satisfied on the market. Um, what are some of the things that, that big tech companies do that make us mad? You know, especially sort of the platform companies. Well, obviously, you know, deplatforming speakers who have views that are not sort of appropriate progressive views, spreading misinformation while claiming to be fighting misinformation, right? Whatever that is. I mean, that's obviously a dominant uh, feature of technology platforms today, having these algorithms that are biased in favor of promoting content that supports one particular ideology, typically an anti market anti-liberty, anti-freedom ideology while making it harder to find content that promotes the kinds of things that most of us like. Obviously, you know, we've already talked a lot about, about so-called wokeism and woke ideologies. You know, all the Fortune 500 are woke, right? They all have big DEI programs and so forth. And many, many though, not all, many of the big tech companies are sort of leading the charge you all saw the famous, infamous video of a, a you know internal uh, Facebook meeting after the 2016 election, where you had the CEO and the other executives cry, uh, literally crying, about the outcome of the election. You know, in an employee meeting, 
right? You, you might think, well, it doesn't seem appropriate to bring one's personal political views into the room, but it was taken for granted that, that everyone, virtually everyone in that company, had the same ideology and that this was appropriate, you know, workplace chatter. Um, but of course, big tech, tech firms, tech platforms, they do a lot of really good things too. Mises.org is a kind of a tech platform, right? It's a nonprofit one. But think about uh, how groups like the Mises Institute, other groups that we've heard about today, and uh, groups that maybe you are involved in that are promoting liberty, that are promoting freedom, that are promoting free markets, right? All of these groups are using technology uh, to, you know, how we, how we communicate, how we disseminate information. Uh, I've been involved in uh, you know, the sort of education and outreach industry for more than 30 years and just looking at the publication process, right? Going from physical newsletters that you had to put in the mail with a stamp and send out and, 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 you know, and, and relying on physical books and so forth to the electronic era of, being, of, of digital communications. It's vastly improved our ability, it's greatly lowered the cost that we have to share and promote the ideas that are important to us. Look at how many books are available in digital form on Mises.org. All the works of Mises and Rothbard and the other great Austrian economists available for people all around the world to consume at, at zero cost. I mean, none of that would have been possible without technology and indeed without big tech, the big tech firms, firms that have now become successful uh, on the market. Th there have been some estimates by uh, economists, you know, mainstream economists have this construct they call consumer surplus, which is which is somewhat bogus from an Austrian point of view. But it, it, you know, it's the idea of their surveys are trying to estimate, you know, what would people be willing to pay for s all of the services that you mostly consume for free? You know, how much would you be willing to pay for Google Maps? How much you would be willing to pay for Wikipedia? You know, you sort of take these things away and see how much people are willing to pay to get them back and so forth. And I mean, the numbers are really, it's really amazing. I mean, most people would pay a lot if they really had to, to use Facebook or to use uh, Microsoft products or other goods and services uh, that they use for free or, or at low cost. Um, on the back side, too, a lot of the things that we that upset us about privacy, things we worry about, not only you know our personal communications and our social media activity, but also our medical records and financial records. I mean, yeah, protecting one's privacy is extremely important, and uh, there are a lot of a lot of market solutions for uh, uh, you know for, for for some of these uh, alleged privacy issues. But also think about the benefits of being able to share information when you go to the doctor, not having to carry around all of your records and your x-rays and so forth in physical form. Uh, think about the ability, how, how a credit ratings have greatly expanded the supply of credit available to borrowers, legitimate credit, of course, not Fed created funny money, right? Um, uh, you know, financial transactions are enabled by the fact that it's easy to get a profile of a person's credit worthiness and so forth. So a lot of benefits to the sorts of things that we often worry about. So that's point number one. You know, it's perfectly fine to be angry and mad at tech companies for things they do in their core business, things they do politically. That's perfectly fine. But we also need to recognize, of course, that there are many benefits to liberty and to the liberty movement from technology. Okay, second point, which I alluded to before, but it's worth emphasizing because I think this point is not always clear. Tech companies are private firms. Okay, they are private companies, literally, right? I mean, Facebook, Twitter, Google, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, I mean, they are for-profit corporations owned by shareholders, just like other private firms. Uh, you know, the fact that in the case of, uh, you know, Twitter, Facebook, and so forth, the fact that they are hosting conversations among people that, that reflect, you know, sort of a new version of the public square. The fact that they are promoting and indeed having influence over dialogue and conversations and interactions that affect how people vote and how people think. The fact that in some sectors like online retail, you have firms that have a very large share of the market. None of that changes the fact that they're private firms. Okay, this first thing to, 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 to get out of the way. 
right? Now, like, like other firms, large and small, in the, what Mises called the mixed economy, big tech firms and small tech firms too, benefit from a variety of special privileges, special protections, subsidies that they get from the state, right? Let's not, I mean, there's no bones about that, but tech firms are not unique with one or two possible exceptions. They're not unique in getting all kinds of privileges, protections, subsidies from the state, right? Lots of companies get those, not just tech companies. You hear people say, well, you know, they rely on subsidized electricity to run their servers. Okay, yeah, but, but lots of firms have subsidies like that. Amazon relies on, you know, subsidized roads to ship its goods and trucks. Well, I mean, so does Walmart, so do small shippers, uh, so do lots of companies. So, you know, it's very hard to disentangle who is sort of a net recipient versus a net, uh, you know, uh, payer or, or someone who is harmed with this vast array of complex government interventions in the economy. So the interventions are certainly making things worse than they otherwise would be, but it doesn't follow from the fact that a firm exists in the mixed economy that it's like, you know, part of the state. You even hear some libertarians say, and you know, they're, they're sort of half joking, but only half joking. You know, well, Google is really a state entity and should be treated as such. I mean, come on. Uh, I, I make those jokes too, but I make them about like Goldman Sachs. Like Goldman Sachs is like a fourth branch of the US government or something like that. I mean, yeah, you can make that case. They're very tight with the state, but they are private. Uh, tech companies do partner with the state in ways that make us uncomfortable, right? They build in back doors to their supposedly encrypted products and applications so that when the FBI or the NSA or the local police department or whoever needs access to your information, it can be provided. Of course, they cooperate with state surveillance agencies to do surveillance themselves and report on suspicious activities. Uh, they happily receive lists of, um, uh, you know, so-called domestic terrorist groups from the relevant authorities. There was a leak that was published by The Intercept last week about a blacklist that Facebook maintains of foreign and domestic hate groups, terror groups, and so forth that they keep off of their platform. And they're happy to, they're happy to partner with state authorities in constructing and sharing those lists. You know, and obviously, they should be criticized for that. But again, it's not, not totally unique. Um, you know, when, when in the last couple of weeks, as you know, there's been a lot of discussion about airlines and whether they'll enforce vaccine mandates for pilots and flight attendants and mechanics and so forth. And there were the, you know, there was the uh, uh, the Southwest Airlines sick out that the authorities insist didn't actually happen. Um, and then, then they sort of backed down, uh, the airlines have backed down a little bit. But you know, one of the points that the airline executives made at that time is that, well, we are federal contractors, right? We, we, we deliver mail, we deliver, you know, we have all kinds of uh, uh, formal relationships with different branches of government for transporting people and goods. And as a federal contractor, we are required to abide by regulations X, Y, and Z, including, you know, vaccine mandates. It turns out, of course, that the Biden administration had not actually issued a vaccine mandate at that time, but that was sort of the conversation. Anyway, my point is we absolutely should be critical of tech firms or any firms for collaborating with the state in ways that are harmful to liberty, but this is not something that is unique to tech firms. I'll say a little bit at the end about, you know, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which may you could be interpreted as providing a sort of a special subsidy that's unique to tech platforms. Because, um, you know, that may be an exception. Okay, point number three, we often talk about big tech. I've sort of been talking about big tech as if it is a monolith, as if big tech is one thing. But there's a lot of variety within that category of big tech. Big tech firms are different from each other. Right, some of them, uh, some of them are basically advertising platforms. You know, Google, Facebook. Uh, Facebook gets about 99% of its revenue from advertisements on Facebook. Okay, Google gets 85% of its revenue from advertising on the Google search page and other Google products and services. So companies like Google, Twitter, Facebook, so forth. You know, these they offer 
free to consumer products and services. Uh, they then use the user data, they analyze the user data to target advertisements for which uh, advertisers are willing to pay a premium. And that, that's, you know, that's their business model. So you think, well, I don't like, their, I don't like that they use my data. Okay, th that's fine. Um, but not all tech firms make money from collecting user data. Apple is a completely different kind of company. Apple is basically a hardware company. Remy can correct me if my statistic is wrong, but the uh, last time I looked, 63% of Apple's revenue comes from selling iPhones. Okay, now iPhones do come with iOS, and of course Apple is also collecting information on users, but Apple's business model is totally different from Facebook's or Google's. It's a, essentially a hardware company. You can also buy uh, Apple Watches and iMacs and so forth, and you can, Apple makes money, of course, from the Apple Store, but it's primarily a hardware company. Uh, Microsoft is a software company that's quite diversified. Microsoft makes, I mean, its number one best-selling product is Office. I don't have the exact revenue breakdown. Um, it gets a chunk of revenue from selling Office. It gets a chunk of revenue from selling its back-end Azure uh, database system for corporate users. It makes money from uh, uh, other platforms that it owns and so forth. Uh, what about Netflix? Is Netflix part of big tech? Well, yeah, a lot of people criticize Netflix as another woke tech firm that's, you know, making me uncomfortable by how much it knows about my viewing habits and it's, it's using all these tricks like next episode starting in five, four, three to get me hooked, get me that dopamine hit, you know, from the next episode of whatever. Yeah, all those criticisms are fine, but I mean, Netflix is a streaming movie company. Netflix is not an advertising platform, right? You pay a subscription fee to access streaming content like, like, a, mag like a magazine in the old days, okay? Uh, even Amazon is, is different from the others. Um, Amazon gets about half its revenue from selling goods and services on Amazon.com. It gets about another 20% from fees that it charges to third-party sellers on its platform. It gets about 10% from Amazon Web Services. It's uh, cloud hosting. Uh, uh, service. So again, Amazon also collects user information, and Amazon may, you know, collaborates with the feds and so forth in ways that make us uncomfortable, but it's a very different kind of a company. So my, my point is, big tech is, is quite heterogeneous, and tech firms have different business models, they have different practices in how they use data, what information they collect on, uh, on us, whether they charge, you know, what, what, how they make their money and so forth, and that's relevant to our discussion uh, as well. And so, okay, fourth point, and this is the one that you know, we're ta emphasizing this weekend and that Jeff really wanted me to talk about. What do we do about all this? What do we do to make things better? Well, I mean, like any other policy question, this is complex, but there are a few things that I think we clearly should not do and some things that we clearly should do. So, you know, what are, what, are, what are approaches that you hear talked about, even within libertarian circles, uh, for dealing with big tech that we should avoid? Okay, number one, we should not have the government take these over, right? We should not nationalize Facebook. We should not turn Facebook into the postal service. We should not demand that it be a neutral platform, like a, like a government-owned public utility that supplies electricity to everyone and cannot discriminate and so forth. I think it's pretty obvious that making platforms government-owned or government-operated would certainly not make these problems that we're discussing better. They would certainly make these problems worse. We should not use antitrust law to, to break up firms into different pieces, force Facebook to sell off Instagram, force Amazon to divest its cloud hosting from its online retail and so forth. I mean, for reasons that are obvious to those of you who have been around and have read any Austrian literature on markets and competition and law and antitrust, that's clearly gonna make a bad situation worse. Uh, by the way, you know, on the point, people say, well, yeah, I don't like antitrust in general, but, you know, tech, tech firms are different because they benefit from this so-called network effect Right? They're sort of winner-take-all markets. You know, everybody wants to be on the same communications platform. You don't want a market that's fragmented into a bunch of different ones. So whoever has first mover advantage can therefore sort of take the whole market. And, and you have to use government to break them up because no one can compete with a dominant t platform you know, because of network effects. 
you know, on that point, when I when I'm teaching uh, when I teach about this teach this in class, I often show my students an article, infamous article that was published about 10 years ago um, uh, by Victor Keegan called, Will MySpace Ever Lose Its Monopoly? <laughs> Question mark, right? So there's a huge amount of competition among platforms. Actually, I don't know if, how many people we have in this room who are like under 20, but I mean, the fastest growing tech platform, of course, is TikTok. Um, which within the space of a year went from almost nothing to being one of the largest platforms. Uh, Facebook has totally stagnated in terms of user growth. Um, uh, during the pandemic, we saw a tiny little startup company that almost no one had ever heard of become the, such a dominant firm in its business market that we now use its name for a verb, right? When you have a video call with somebody, you, you have a Zoom. Yeah, hey, let's Zoom this afternoon. Um, it is, and it's, uh, predictably, uh, as soon as Zoom became the dominant uh, uh, video conferencing platform, you started to see, you know, hand wringing from economists and public policy people and journalists about, oh my gosh, yeah, how how can Zoom ever be dislodged from its monopoly position? We need to break it up with antitrust. I'm like Zoom didn't exist, you know, six months ago almost, and the the market was dominated by Cisco, WebEx, and Microsoft. Who knows what else? Right? I mean, it's sort of a contradiction in terms. Zoom shows how network effects are irrelevant, or network effects do not prevent a new firm from entering a networked industry if it's better, if it offers better features or whatever. Um, okay, we should not have uh, government regulation that enforces so-called content neutrality. Right? So, you know, Congress should pass a law that says, you know, Twitter is... Twitter cannot promote Jeff Deist's tweets and demote Peter Klein's tweets. That should be a, some kind of an antitrust violation. Or it, it should be forced to be like the old telephone network where anybody who wanted to make a call could make a call. Um, you know, obvious reasons why that, that's, you know, that's just interfering with the business model, of course. Okay. Um, uh, the whole idea that these firms are part of the public square, again, is irrelevant because to you know, to us, to libertarians, the public square just refers to places where people in public interact, which include private spaces, like this hotel room, right? The, we're, in a, we're in a privately owned hotel ballroom right now, but we're interacting amongst each other. We're having a kind of a public square discussion here, but it's on private, it's on private property. Um, you sometimes hear uh, regulators say, well, uh, platforms should be forbidden from promoting their own products. Right, so it used, you know, it used to be the case if you did a search on Google or some other platform for the weather forecast in Tampa, the first search result would be the Weather Channel, right? But now what comes up first is just Google's weather forecast, and you got to scroll down a little bit, you know, to find the link to the Weather Channel. Uh, Google, go, thanks to Google Flights, if you search for a flight route or something in Google, the first hit is Google's own flight search engine. And you have to scroll down a little bit to get to Expedia or Travelocity or American Airlines or whatever you want. There's some regulators who want to make that illegal. Uh, they say, well, the, the platforms are using their dominance to promote their own uh, products and services that compete with ones that are also on their platform. Well, I mean, okay, if you want to do that, then, you, then we would have to outlaw Sam's Cola being available at Walmart, you know, next to the Coca-Cola on the shelf. Right, you have to outlaw all private label products that are uh, and, and generics and others that essentially compete with the the dominant label products. I mean, there's no no good reason from an Austrian perspective, in terms of efficiency uh, or 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 you know equity to to require some kind of a rule like that. It doesn't make any sense. What about restrictions on data? I've heard people who identify as free market enthusiasts advocate for laws that make it illegal for tech platforms to collect user information. You know, unless maybe you explicitly consent to every single, you know, bit of, of data they want to, like computer, in the computer sense, bit uh, of, of data they want to collect. Yeah, yeah, you clicked the license when you installed the app, but you didn't read it, that doesn't count. Um, or you have similar rules that say your data has to be stored in a portable format. 
You know, if I, if I regularly use Expedia to search for flights, it's got my search history so that it can help me find options that I want more quickly. And then I decide, oh, I don't like Expedia anymore. I'm going to move to Travelocity. I should be able to, like, export my file and plug it into Travelocity and have the exact same experience on Travelocity. Well, aside from that being technically impossible, right, um, you know, th that means that if, if, if platforms that rely on advertising revenue if platforms that, whose business model depends on aggregating, collecting, synthesizing, analyzing user information and using it to target high-valued ads, uh, if, that's, if that is uh, uh, prohibited, then those platforms will have to come up with a new revenue model. There won't be any more free Google searching, right? There, there won't be any Facebook for free. I mean, you'll have to pay a user fee for all of the services that you use, or maybe uh, um, uh, there will be some other kind of model that entrepreneurs will have to figure out, a subscription-based model, maybe they'll look for sponsorships, I mean, who knows, but the, the, you won't be able to use platforms the way you use them now for free, and they won't be able to provide a lot of useful information to you that relies on having detailed information about your user profile. You know, do we want that? Well, look. There's nothing on the free market that prevents firms from using that business model now. And of course, some of them do. There are plenty of paid services that you can get on the internet. Um, if consumers really valued privacy enough that they're willing to pay a fee to use a service rather than a, use a free advertised, uh, advertise, uh, base, uh, advertisement based service, uh, then they're, they're free to do so now. And many people do, but not most. Right? How many of you use DuckDuckGo as your primary search engine? Yeah, I mean, in, in, a, in a normal crowd, if I were speaking to a civilian audience, you know, it might be one out of 100. These are libertarians, after all. But uh, yeah, I mean, DuckDuckGo is a tiny, tiny market penetration because the typical user thinks, yeah, the search results aren't as good as they are on the big G. And yeah, I know Google collects my stuff and I don't like it, but I'm not willing to pay the price of having less accurate search results or a search engine that doesn't have some other feature uh, that I like, okay? Um, by the way, one, you know, uh, uh, just a, a small side note on privacy, because I think it often gets forgotten. I mean, in some ways, you could say we have more privacy now than we did in the era before technology, before big tech, before e-commerce and so forth. I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know, say I have some medical condition and it requires some meta, you know, some treatment or some ointment or something, and I'm kind of embarrassed. I don't want anybody to know that I have to have this product, that I have this condition. Okay, yeah, I don't like the fact that Amazon knows that, you know, I've bought a whole bunch of this thing, whatever it might be. Maybe I have some weird, I have some weird obsession with, you know, Tom DiLorenzo books or something. I buy huge quantities of Tom DiLorenzo books sort of a fetish for me. I don't like the fact that Mises.org knows my transaction history. I don't like the fact that Amazon knows my transaction history. But I mean, prior to big tech, the only way to satisfy that fetish would be walk into Barnes & Noble or walk into the local bookstore in my town, and then I might see my friends and neighbors. They might see me hauling off a bunch of you know, Tom DiLorenzo books. I mean, at least I can do it from the privacy of my own home uh, in, the, in, in, in the current era. That's something that uh, is, worth, is worth taking into account. Okay, so, so what should we do? Well, look, I mean, it's, it's, not, that, it's not that complicated. Uh, in, in terms of our behavior on the market, if we're not happy with the goods and services that are being offered to us, the best alternative is not to use them right, or to use alternative products and services. As we've already heard this morning, entrepreneurs are very good at coming up with alternatives, at working around obstacles and barriers. There are plenty of alternative communications platforms and, and, and uh, web-based services available to us if we prefer to patronize those other than the dominant firms. We can certainly do that. We should encourage entrepreneurs and, and, and roll back barriers to entrepreneurship that limit the ability of new firms to compete, of entrepreneurs to compete. And certainly we should roll back, eliminate any subsidies that are specifically benefiting tech platforms. You know, my, my view on Section 230 is that we should get rid of it, but we should get rid of the whole Communications Decency Act, of which Section 230 is just a little piece. I think that would go a long way to solving some of our problems. So I'm sorry, I didn't have my phone in front of me to check the time, but we have maybe time for one or two questions. No, one question? Yeah, please. 
Say, say it loud since you don't have a mic. Yeah, so the question is, would we see more of the sort of freemium model, free ad-based services, uh, you know, outside of technology for physical goods and services? I mean, sure, I mean, there are plenty of examples of that now. There are lots of free giveaways. You go into the grocery store, you know, by the deli section, sometimes they have a little, you know, you can have little pieces of cheese or whatever to, pastries or whatever to sample. I mean, that's a, that's a giveaway to get you in the door or to make you stay in the store longer, to have you shop. Uh, longer and so forth, uh, so that you'll then spend more money on the on the priced products. That's essentially not too different from the so-called freemium model, except it's on a smaller scale. So, um, in a pure free market, would we see more uh, advertising-based rather than fee-based goods and services? I mean, my answer is I really don't know, but I would love to see how entrepreneurs figure that out. So let's have a free market and give it a shot. <laughs>